Okay, well, we're going to take our Bibles this morning, and we're going to go right over to Acts chapter 16. And I'd like for us to read verse 9. We could just read that together, and then we'll bow together in prayer as we begin. Acts chapter 16 and verse number 9. God's Word. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And that's the simple text this morning, something everyone can understand. Come over into Macedonia and help us. It's a gripping text of Scripture. And may we hear the cry, this cry for help from the city today. Let's pray. Father, thank you now for this day. Thank you, God, for just the wonderful privilege we have to be in your house. Continue to bless this service today as we serve you and praise you during this special time of our missions conference. Lord, help us to hear this cry for help from the city. Dear God, as this man of Macedonia cried out to Paul years ago, but we believe this cry is still going on right now, right now, there's cries for help. Lord, we pray that you will give us those opportunities to hear these cries and to help those in their need, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I remember years ago when we started a church on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn and around the corner from our church, there were guys always hanging out and, you know, drinking, and they would have their wine bottles in their, in their little brown sacks. And I would go around the neighborhood and pass out tracks and talk to them. And I got to know them pretty well. And one guy's name was Slim. Randy was the owner of that, not owner, but he, his, he was really the renter of that particular apartment as well. And I got to know Randy. So one night, I just felt led to go and visit to Randy's apartment. I was with, actually, I was with Joe Lacroix, who was one of our members, and he went on to have a tremendous ministry in Haiti, and he recently went to be with the Lord. But anyway, Joe and I were visiting together that night, and Randy's door was never locked, so we just pushed open the door, uh, because this apartment was used by the drunkards who would hang out there to just to crash at night. So I remember as I pushed open the door though and thought, wow, in Brooklyn, not even a lock on the door. And as I walked down the hallway, I looked into the bathroom and I saw an old beat up stove in the bathtub. And the sticky floor was just caked with dirt and empty bottles. In the main room, men sat on broken down, chairs and couches. It almost looks like the kind of chairs you would see that were out for the garbage men to take away, but they took them before the garbage men got them. It was early evening. The shades were drawn. It wasn't entirely dark, but darkness was settling in. And they told me there was no electricity in this apartment. Con Ed had shut it off. And the only light they had was in a paint tray in the middle of that room. And in that paint tray was just one candle. And that was the light as the darkness came and settled upon them as they laid out after a day of drinking on their broken down couches and chairs. And that candle light just seemed to like flicker. And I could see the broken down bodies of these men. And I could see their grief etched faces. And I could see Slim, because I had talked to him the most. I, I saw Slim lying on a couch, just lying. He, and I said, Slim. And he couldn't even wake up to talk to me that evening. But Slim, I could still hear his voice because he stuttered. And I remember one time he told me, he said, I, 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 I you, you, you used to, 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 to be a, 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 a preacher with a stuttered voice. He was always drunk, and it was as if his mind had just become completely fried and destroyed 
by the drinking. So I shared the gospel the best I knew how that night. I don't know how much impact, frankly, that I, it had, I had on, upon them, but I did what I could in their darkness with that flickering candlelight, and I left. And a few weeks later, I went by again, and the guys were standing out drinking, but Slim wasn't there. I said, oh, where's Slim? Oh, he's in the hospital. And then a few weeks after that, I went by again. I said, how's Slim? And they said, oh, Slim died when he went to the hospital. And when I read this verse of scripture, somehow I could hear Slim's voice in those words. And I could almost hear the same stuttering when he said, come, 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 come over into Macedonia and help us. This is the cry for help, a cry for humanity. And this often call, we call it the Macedonian vision. And a vision is a supernatural sight. Paul really saw something, but it was a vision. We don't know whether it was a real man or not. It was a vision in the night, but it was a real sight, something he saw. And when it says in this verse, a vision appeared to Paul, and there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him. That's in the tense of like he was praying him continually. Like, come over. Come over into Macedonia. You've got to come, Paul. Please come. Please come. It wasn't just a one-time thing. It was a continuous appeal for help. And that's what we need to hear as missionaries in New York City. And that's what we've been sharing with our church family here during this missions conference is we have a missionary family with us, but he's not the only missionary here. Who's the missionaries? Put your hand up if you're a missionary. That means if you're saying we should all be missionaries. So the challenge is for all of us to be urban missionaries, to be city missionaries. We need to hear the cry for help. Those listening to me on Zoom today, hear this cry for help. Be a missionary. We need to take this responsibility upon ourselves to hear this cry. So three simple things, just from that one statement, come over into Macedonia and help us. The first statement is come over. Is this supposed to go? Or does this go? Well, I, I hit it, but it didn't. I'll, I'll try to advance later. Yeah. I turned it on. Yeah. So. Okay, so Paul is on his second missionary journey. And as he is going through Asia, he started, of course, he started uh, down here in Antioch. He started in Antioch and he went through this area. And the Bible says he went through Galatia. You see where it says Galatia? Just find those places on your map it says he had gone through phrygia and galatia phrygia is oh it's not it's not here actually on the map but it's in this region also obviously of galatia and then it says they were forbidden of the holy ghost to preach the word in asia so when they went into asia the holy spirit didn't give them any rest to stay there in Asia. So they kept going through Asia. And then it says in verse 7, they were come to Mycenae and they essayed to go down into Bithynia. So they went into this area of Mycenae and they were forbidden to stay in this area as well. So they kept going. So in other words, to hear the cry for help, you don't stop. Don't be discouraged. Here's Paul on his missionary journey. He's like, okay, Lord. And God says, no, not here. <laughs> well, where? Paul's like, well, I give up. I want to just go to Asia. What, what if Paul's vision was just to go to Asia? He would have missed out. He would have missed the vision. So he just kept moving. Paul's like an energizer bunny. And he's not being discouraged as he moves. And the Holy Spirit is saying, no, not here. Keep moving. Keep moving. So what does he do? Where does he end up in verse number eight? And this is where Bible geography helps. 
Because look, what town does he end up in? Charles. Now, where's Charles? It's all the way at the end of Asia. It's the seaport city. Where can he go after Charles? Nowhere, as far as land, after Charles. So he's like, Lord, I went through this whole way, and you didn't direct me to any area. So he came to Troas, and now he's wondering, what do I do now? And this is where he hears this cry. And I call it a cry of inconvenient opportunity. Micah said earlier that the word opportunity is his key word. And so here it is, the first point of the message today. But this is, not all opportunities are convenient, in other words. God will give you an opportunity, and you might have to inconvenience yourself. And that's exactly what Paul has to do. He's like, hey, I'm here. There's people in Asia to reach. I can go to Ephesus, plenty of people in Ephesus. Later on, he would go to Ephesus, but this wasn't the time for Ephesus. And so, this man of Macedonia says, come over into Macedonia and help us. I call it a cry of inconvenient opportunity because he had to cross over to get to Macedonia. What did he have to do? He has to cross this. This is a dangerous waterway in those, those days, you know, to go by boat. He had to, he had to go across the water. He had to go through obstacles and obstructions, face difficulties and dangers. It was the fear of the unknown to go into Macedonia. And Macedonia was a general area. It wasn't a specific city. It was a general area there of Northern Greece. So I call it a cry of inconvenient opportunity. But Paul hears this cry. Now two truths must be valued to seize these opportunities, to hear the cry, come over. Two, I say two truths, because if you actually look up this little phrase, come over, you'll see it appears only three times in the New Testament. One time here, and then two other times, and I'd like for us to read those. And so I'd like to ask somebody to get Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29. Who can find Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29? And Brother Edgar will do that. And this is not working. So that's okay, just... Can you flip the slide? Okay, so this is just a little bit of a, I, I had a closer shot so you could see now of Macedonia, the area of Macedonia. Yeah, just keep it there for a moment. And let me just show you, let me just show you this though. Uh, Macedonia was a critical area of this time in, in Paul's history because through Macedonia ran the Route 80 of his day, if you will. It, it was a transportation hub. And through Macedonia, the Grand Central Station was in Macedonia. Penn Station, you know, like a transportation hub. Because a, a road called the Ignatian Way ran right through Macedonia and through these cities of Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. And so people from all the world traveling from Rome in the west to the east went through the, this Ignatian Way. And so God was leading Paul to this area of Macedonia. Okay, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, as saying to do, were drawn. Okay, so how did they pass through the Red Sea? By faith. That word passed is the same expression, come over. So how was Paul going to go over into Macedonia? By faith. He had to have faith. If we're going to hear the cry for help, we must have faith. We must have faith in the word of God, that the word of God is the real help they need. We must have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the savior of the world, and there's salvation in no other. We must have faith in the power of the gospel. We must believe that the same gospel that saves us can save anyone. We must have faith in the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. We must have faith in the power of his resurrection, that he is alive like we've been singing in that great song. Our theme song talks about how Jesus saves and Jesus is alive. 
we must have faith in the Great Commission, that that Great Commission is for you, sister, and it's for me as well. It's for the missionary, the career missionary, if you will. But, you know, one thing I love about New Testament Christianity is I don't see this, like, big division between a full-time, if I can use that expression, a full-time servant of God, a full-time pastor, a full-time missionary, and the lay person, if I could use that expression. I really don't like to, but, but we, we, we make those divisions in our mind, don't we? And think, well, I'm, a, I'm not a full-time in the ministry, so I can't serve the Lord as much. Well, maybe you don't have as much time as somebody who is just given all their time to it. I realize that. But you're just as important in the work of the Lord, just as vital, and just as much a servant. And serving God on your job, yes. Serving God at your home, yes. Serving God as a mother, yes. Serving God, doing your work functions and relating and communicating with the different people in your office and work situation, but also serving the Lord in the church. You have a multi-faceted, full-time ministry for Jesus Christ. Really, all of us are full-time servants of Jesus. Amen. And I, one thing that made the New Testament church so dynamic and powerful is that everyone was involved in the work. It wasn't just the apostles. It wasn't just the deacons. It was everyone saw themselves as a servant, as one filled with the Spirit in order to be a witness for the Lord. You know, I think Orthodox type religions, like Roman Catholic and that kind of thing, they, you know, when the religious people dress up and they look so different and they look so, ooh, you know, and we call them different names that give them kind of like, put them on a pedestal, like Holy Father of, or something like that, it, it creates a division. Like they're more holy than I am or they serve God better than I can or, you know, there's some kind of a division between the believer and those who are serving, you know, in, in ministry kind of thing, you know, in a, in a, in a more full-time sense. If I could again, yeah, I don't want to use that expression. But, but we should wash all that away because we're one in Jesus Christ. And the way I really look at it is God's called me to be a pastor. And if God's called you to be a school teacher, you're a faithful school teacher, you'll get just as much reward as any missionary or pastor because being a teacher is your mission right now. So be faithful and serve the Lord. We need faith. That's how they passed through the Red Sea. And that's how Paul was going to pass through the Sagean Sea. And not only that, the second time this verse, this phrase is used in the New Testament is in Luke chapter 16, verse 26. And this is a very familiar passage. This is with the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man is in hell. Who could read for us this morning Luke chapter 16 and verse 26? You have it? Okay, Brother Jeff. 16:26. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Okay, so Abraham is speaking in this verse of scripture as God's representative, and he's responding to the rich man who is in hell, who says what? Send Lazarus. I need help. This rich man in hell is crying out for help. Send Lazarus. Abraham is responding. And he says, no help can come. No one can pass. And the word in verse 26, that's the word in our text in Acts, 19, uh, Acts 16, 9, where it says, they which would pass from hence, that is from paradise to hell, cannot Neither can they pass to us. So those in hell cannot pass to paradise. Those in paradise cannot. There's a great gulf fixed between the two. And so this reminds us of the inevitability of eternity. And how eternity fixes destiny. 
when you die, and if you die without Jesus Christ, hell is going to open up its jaws, and it's going to close its mouth on you, and you'll be in hell for all eternity, and you'll never escape. There will be no appeals. There's no higher court, no higher judge, no higher king to appeal your case to. If you die without Jesus Christ, you will have rejected the king of kings and the judge of all the earth who always does right. And you'll be in hell. But if you're in heaven, you'll be in heaven. And that too is fixed. Praise God. One of the most surprising things, you know what I think one of the most surprising, you're going to be so surprised in heaven. And you know what it's going to be? That I'm there. <laughs> that you're there. <laughs> I heard a preacher one time say that. He said, the most surprising thing about heaven is like, I can't believe it. I'm here. I can't believe it. You know, this is great. <laughs> of course, we do believe we're going to be there. But actually, when we're there, we're going to be like, I can't believe it. This is better than we could have imagined. Heaven is going to be so glorious, and we're going to see Jesus Christ. I can't wait to see the nail prints on his hands. And we want everyone to be with Jesus. That's why we do what we do. Beloved, quite frankly, if there wasn't a hell to gain and a, hell, a heaven to gain and a hell to lose, there wasn't a heaven to gain and a hell to lose, I don't know whether we'd be here. I don't know whether I'd be in the ministry. I mean, there's something great to gain, and that's to be with Jesus and glorify him along the way. And there's something awful to shun, and that's a real place of hell and fire and flames. And it's an, there's an eternity that is inevitable in all of our lives. And so the point is, come over and help us take the opportunities we have now, because someday we won't have that opportunity. That's the point. Take the opportunity now, beloved. Because once we're in heaven, we won't be able to pass over and help those who really need the greatest help. And we have so many opportunities in our city. We've heard a little bit about it. But what a great city is New York. Let's not give up on New York City. Let's have a heart and passion, even more for New York City in such a time as this. You know what the world is talking about? The, the dangers increasing, and yeah, and people moving, yeah, okay. But that doesn't mean we, we move. We don't run with the world. We have to follow God's will. Now, if God leads you to move, that, that's between you and God. I'm not saying, you know, a, a Christian can't move at this time out of New York City. I'm not saying that at all. But I will say this, when we came to New York City in 1984, it was in a very bad situation at that time. There was an average of five homicides a day in New York City when we moved here in 1984. And so let's believe God has us here in its 6,400 miles of streets, 230 miles of subway lines, about 8 million people. And do you know we live in one of the most amazing areas of the world to li either live in or around? Some of us live in. Some of you live in. Some of us live around Manhattan. You know, there's no place in the world like Manhattan Island. It's 23 square miles. It is the second smallest county land-wise in the United States. That's an amazing thing to think about. Every county in the United States is larger than Manhattan, except I think one in Hawaii somewhere. But of course, it's the most populated county in the United States. 1.6 million people live in Manhattan. And on a work day, pre-COVID, there were almost 4 million people on this little island. And we pray it will get back there. And what an opportunity we have to bring the gospel. And you all know who this dear brother is. Remember him? And so we remember our brother James. And one day in our homeless outreach, and I wasn't actually on that homeless outreach that day, but Vinny Abrazisi was there and there were others. And James was here, just like so many people come from all around the world. He was from Ghana. And he was a, he was a mining engineer, could speak multiple languages, and actually fled Ghana because he was going to expose the corruptions going on inside the, the mining industry. Because, 
you know, think about people mining diamonds. What do you think a lot of people are going to do with those diamonds? Right? <laughs> Steal them. Well, he was ex going to expose that and his life was in danger and he fled. And he, there he was at Penn Station, homeless. And God led Brother Vinny and others of our church to him. And Vinny was able to help him right away and help him find housing and, and help get him, a, uh, I know, a, a cell phone and helped him in practical ways. And, and Brother James became such a dear and beloved member of our church. And he remained in his homeless condition throughout his years, even at Heritage, but he would always come to church and you would never know he was homeless. He, he would have a beautiful suit on and a tie and he was always uh, well taken care of, but God took him home. And so let us believe there are people like James out there for us to reach who are crying, come over, come over and help us. The second thing I want us to see not only a cry of inconvenient opportunity, and we need faith to hear this cry. We need to understand the inevitability of eternity to hear this cry. Do you know what these buildings are, by the way? Do you know what these buildings are? I'm going across, when I took this picture of the Willie, I'm going across the Willie B Bridge. Some of us are very familiar, aren't we, Pastor Carmine, with that site right there. Pastor Carmine, how many times have you seen those buildings? But how many times have we thought of all the people crying out in need from those buildings? The drugs, the abuse, the alcohol, ravaging, the breakdown of the homes and the divorce and so many problems. These, are, these first buildings here are, are city projects and then there's uh, other housing, other kinds of housing developments as well. North of there is, is Stuyvesant Town. I mean, really along the East River, you have all kinds of housing. You have city housing, state housing, you have Stuyvesant Town, and then even below the Willie B, you have more uh, New York City uh, housing uh, depart, uh, apartments. I mean, there's just hundreds of thousands of people living in there. I wonder if God would touch our heart to hear the cry and go there and share the gospel. Second thing is, he says, come over into Macedonia. So this is a cry to a diverse city center. This is a cry that will lead Paul to a place where there's people gathered from all around the world. Macedonia, this area of northern Greece. Each of these cities had its own unique makeup. So I'm not going to get in, in, into all of that. But I will just say that Macedonia had people from all over the world there. So this was an area of great ethnic diversity. In fact, who was the first person, in a sense, who responded to the gospel there in Macedonia? The first person, in, in a way, who cried out for help was in verse 14. Who is this woman? This is the first person who responded to the gospel in Macedonia. What was her name? Lydia. Lydia. And where was Lydia from? You could say she was an immigrant from Thyatira. Where's Thyatira? What part of the world at that time would that be called? That would be called Asia, which I think I thought was very interesting. Why? Because when Paul was going through that part of the world and he tried to go into Asia, but it says in verse number six that the Holy Spirit did what? forbade to Paul, Paul to go into Asia. Why? Not because God didn't love the people of Asia. God loves the people of all the world. And in fact, God loves the people of Asia. And the first person Paul reached for salvation in Macedonia was a woman from Asia. So that's kind of like New York. You know, you go to New York and you can reach somebody from another part of the world. So we see in that the ethnic diversity and there's Thyatira up here on the map. You could see it in Asia. So here's Thyatira. And what do we know Thyatira as? What's Thyatira as well? That's one of the cities where, exactly where, and, and later on in Acts 19, if you keep reading the Acts passage, Paul goes to Ephesus in Acts 19, 
and it says all Asia heard the word of the Lord, most people believe these churches were started at that time, and then the Apostle John became the pastor of the church of Ephesus, and later on wrote the book of Revelation to those seven churches of Asia. One of those cities was Thyatira. So Paul ministered in these three great cities of Macedonia. Philippi was like a Roman colony. Thessalonica was the former area where Alexander of Macedon, Alexander the Great, Alexander of Macedonia was from this area. And he became the mighty ruler of the world. So this was an area that had tremendous history to it and Berea. And so Paul went to these three urban areas. And again, that's very interesting. God says to Paul through this man of Macedonia, come over into Macedonia. So he was going to go into Macedonia. Where does he go to reach Macedonia? Where's the first place he goes? He goes to Philippi. Now, why do you think Philippi? Verse 12. What does it say about Philippi in verse 12 that's significant? It was the chief city. So in going to the area of Macedonia, the first place he goes to is the most influential city of Macedonia, to Philippi. And, and then he went to Philippi, and of course he helped this woman Lydia. He helped the Philippian jailer, of course, who was saved when he was imprisoned there. But then when he left Philippi, did he leave Macedonia? No, he went in Acts 17 to, what's the city there that he goes to in Acts 17 verse 1? He went to Thessalonica, the second important city of Macedonia. And then when he left Thessalonica, did he leave Macedonia? Not quite yet. Then in Acts 17, verse 10, he went to the city of Berea. Berea. And so these were the three key cities of Macedonia. Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. After Paul went to Berea, did he leave Macedonia? Yes. So what's the point? The point is, come into Macedonia, help us, and... The way he brought the greatest help to Macedonia was by going to the chief cities of Macedonia. And so it's things like this, beloved, quite frankly, when I saw these in the Bible and I began to study urban ministry, I saw this. And that's why we came to New York City. And this is why we're still here in the city. Somehow, I believe going to the city will have the greatest impact upon the, the general areas. And so... As Paul heard this cry to go to this area of ethnic diversity, to minister to these three great cities of Macedonia, I believe this cry for help that led him then to the great cities of Macedonia echoed in his heart throughout the rest of his life. And in a sense, this Macedonian cry directed his steps throughout the rest of his ministry days. Because this cry rippled through his life. Because when he left Macedonia, when he left Berea, where did he go? Acts 17. He went to Athens, the university city of the world. When he left Athens in Acts 17, where did he go? Corinth, the commercial capital of Greece at that time. When he left Corinth, where did he go? He went to Ephesus, the capital of Asia Minor at that time. When he left Ephesus, where did he go? He says, I must go to Rome. And he actually got there not exactly the way he wanted to, but he did go to Rome. So he, after he went, so this Macedonian call, I believe, changed Paul's direction to focus in the rest of his ministry life on the great urban areas of his day. The city centers. Because even what we're seeing now, just think of what we're seeing now in our cities and the violence in our cities. It kind of starts in the main cities, New York, Los Angeles. Now we see it happening in Rochester and in pretty much, well, what's, the, what's the city in Wisconsin? I can, uh, Nicole, Kenosha. Kenosha. Yeah, Kenosha. It's like a, like a Midwestern town. We're seeing the violence spread around, but it's first had its start in Seattle in Portland, Los Angeles, New York, and then it spreads. What's 
So what happens in the city doesn't stay in the cities. And what cities are, nations become. And we are in the, we are, you know, in the epicenter of what goes on, aren't we, in Manhattan? It seems like we're always in the epicenter of whatever's happening. So may God use us to hear these cries for help. And so the third point is we see not only a cry of inconvenient opportunity come over, and we see a cry to the diverse city centers of his day, but we hear a cry of extreme urgency. Just that simple little phrase, help us. That's actually a compound word, two words in that one word. One word is run, and he's saying to Paul, run, run. So I, I see a building on fire, and somebody's about to burn up, and they're like, help, help, run, quick. You don't have much time. That's the impact of this cry, help us. It's a command. He's not suggesting for Paul to come. He's shouting and commanding for Paul to come. Come and help us. What's interesting here, we really don't know who this man of Macedonia was was it was in a vision he was i believe crying out to paul for those that paul would reach with the gospel some say though it was luke i don't know but some surmise that maybe in this vision it was luke because at this point in the passage the author luke of course wrote the book of acts joins Paul in his ministry, and we see that by the pronouns used. So look, look, for example, in Acts 16, look at verse 10, where it says, after he, Paul, had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So they, they definitely, certainly gathered that this cry was a cry from God. This was a call from God to go. But it says, called us, and we went, therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia. And again, those personal pronouns are used that Luke is now with Paul. So somehow, Paul and Luke latched together and didn't let go throughout the rest of this missionary journey. Come over, help us. When you think of urgent cries in the Bible, who do you think of? I think of Bartimaeus. Remember, what did Bartimaeus cry? He said, son of David, have mercy on us. Have mercy. I think of that man with the son. The disciples could not heal him. And what did he say to the Lord? He said, he cried out, if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and, and what? Help us. The same expression used here. So have mercy on us, help us. And a third great cry I think of, a cry of great urgency is in this chapter and it's the Philippian jailer and you know it. What did he cry out? What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And that's the, that's the help people need. That's what they ultimately cry for, mercy, like Bartimaeus, compassion, like that father salvation like this philippian jailer people need mercy where are they going to find mercy where are they going to find help compassion in jesus now notice this help us was the cry how long did it take for paul to respond verse 10 what does it say immediately okay then and what was the help they were going to bring? Also at the end of verse 10, what was the help? So they needed help. When we think people need help, we, we often think, well, they, they need material resources, and, and I don't have the money they need. I don't have the clothing they need. I don't have the housing. And those are real needs. I'm not saying that they're not. But what is the ultimate help people need? What does it say? The gospel. That's right. That's right. So we... We're often and always limited in our resources. And I often am frustrated that we cannot help people more. I get, I get calls from people all the time and they want help with housing and this and that. And I'm like, we're, our church has been homeless all these years. I have let's often tell them. I, we really have a hard time providing housing for you in our church. We, we like get moved around. We're kind of a homeless church. But you know, the ultimate help people need, the ultimate help is in the gospel. 
Jesus Christ, the greatest help, the greatest help. This is what we need to have faith. The greatest help that we can give to anyone is to give them the gospel. Now, maybe we give them the gospel by often, you know, meeting a material need like we do with the homeless outreach. And that's not wrong. Or, or Brother Tim wants to start a community center and starting that community center, use that as an inroad to bring the gospel to them. But we don't just do those social things. As Christians, we believe the ultimate help that everyone needs is the gospel. And those without the gospel are in the greatest need of help. That's why we're all missionaries. If you know Jesus and you know the gospel, you have, you have, dear sister, what people ultimately need. And God will put those people in your path. Help us. Well, a lot of people were crying, help us. We just had another 9-11. You know, next year will be 20 years. A 20 year. I, I, I was like amazed when I went to, um, I spoke at the Bible College in Ankeny, Iowa. And it was just around that 9-11 time. I think the day before nine, the anniversary of 9-11. And um, I was thinking, wow, a lot of the, these young people here, they were like one or two years old. <laughs> like, yeah, I was like, it doesn't seem that long. If we lived through it, does it seem that long ago at all? It doesn't seem that long ago, but that's the way time is. But this first picture, I took this picture when you see the Twin Towers, I took this on the corner right of where the Village Community School was. And that's how close where our church was meeting when 9-11 happened. I took it right on the corner of West 10th Street, and I think that's uh, Washington or, or yeah, Greenwich, Greenwich. Now that would be down uh, s south from you. That would be or going uh, west one block. You're on Greenwich, right? I, yeah, I was on I was on the other corner of yeah yeah that's Washington right the the yeah that was on the corner of Washington yeah but looking right at the World Trade Center and this other picture was taken by Teddy Perez he was working at the Verizon building at the time right across the street and there were holes blown into the Veri into that Verizon building and he went to the, his office and literally craned out the window and just took pictures of the belly of ground zero. I mean, looking right down into ground zero. In this picture, it was in my office and I'd like to hang it up somewhere. I don't really have an office in our new, new uh, condominium, but this picture means a lot to me because it was given to me by a New York City firefighter. And he was working uh, for uh, a a fire company that was right at the base of the Brooklyn Bridge at the time of the 9-11 attack. Can you see the fire truck on the Brooklyn Bridge? <laughs> you really can't see it very well. But the only vehicle on this building is a fire truck. And it, it's right here. And I did take a, a closer up view of it. And you can see it better here. So here it is. The only vehicle on the Brooklyn Bridge moving to the fire is this fire truck, fire department, it was fire truck 205. And they were moving to those flames and to the billowing, billowing smoke of the World Trade Center. And every man on that fire truck that day died. I went to the funeral of one of them. The man who gave me this picture worked for that company, but he wasn't on duty at the time. Otherwise he would have been on it and he would have died. But the firefighters and police officers that day responded to the call for help. They went, now we, could, now we understand in hindsight, they went against impossible odds. They went with insufficient resources. They did not have the resources they needed to put the fire out that was going on. But let me ask you, do you think they thought they did when they went? I kind of believe they did. They had faith in what their abilities were and their resources, but they didn't have what was needed. And I thought of them and I wondered, did they have more faith in their limited resources than we have in our infinite resources? Mm -hmm. We have infinite resources of the word of God, the Holy Spirit, the power of the gospel, Jesus Christ dwelling in us. 
Why did they go that day? Who, what were they doing? They were saving people's physical lives. Is that important? Absolutely. We don't minimize that. We honor that. We rightly respect that, that they're putting their lives on their line for other people, but they're simply trying to save their physical life. But let me ask you, I sometimes am convicted that they, have, they see greater value in physical life than we see in someone's what? Eternal life. See, what we're trying to do is to bring somebody to have eternal life. Even people who were saved that day, many have died since then. But when people are born again spiritually, they never die. And then I wonder if they had less fear of death than we have. I mean, this is bravery, moving to the fire. And in a sense, we have to spiritually be like that today. We have to move to the danger, but know that we have the power of the gospel. So let me just share this in closing about Hudson Taylor. And you know that I love the life of the great missionary to China, Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor had such a vision for the unoccupied provinces, the deep interior of China. It was, he heard the cry for help. The deep interior of China was crying out to Hudson Taylor, come over into Macedonia and help us. And in the autobiography of his life, there's a chapter entitled, Not Disobedient to the Heavenly Vision. And he tells the story where Mr. Taylor met some of the young missionaries landing in Shanghai and meeting them and then introducing himself to them. And when he met them, for one, he was in Chinese clothing. They didn't even recognize who he was. They had to say, oh, this is Hudson Taylor. Otherwise, they never would have recognized him because the way he was dressed and even the way he carried his Chinese umbrella was just like a national Chinese person would do it. But Hudson Taylor met these young men and he said to them, after a long journey, he said, perhaps you would like to accompany me to my hotel. They're like, oh, probably, oh, that sounds good, a hotel, I could use a good sleep. So they agreed, but they didn't know what they had in store for them. So Mr. Taylor walked with them from the dock, and he walked along a major thoroughfare, and it's still, I believe it's still there, it's called the Bund in Shanghai. And it's alongside a river, and at that time, there was an American settlement, and an English settlement, and a French settlement. That's where, you know, people from the West would live. And they probably thought, oh, we're going through the settlement and that's where Taylor lives. But he went through the English settlement and they kept going. And he went through the uh, British settlement and they kept going. And he went through the French settlement and he still kept going. They're probably thinking, when are we going to get there? You know, where are we going? Where's Hudson Taylor leading us? And so they kept walking and now they were in the midst of of where all the Chinese people were living and trading and hustling. And it's described like this in his autobiography. There were heaps of odorous refuse, fish, vegetables, muck from the streets, filth of all sorts, stenches, massive and unrelieved. And it, so here were these young foreigners and it was all coming into them and they were taking it all in. Finally, Hudson Taylor turned off the bund and he went up a side street and he weaved his way through the crowds and he stopped outside a post office and he said, our hotel is here. I'm like, huh? It's a post office. And he went, he went into the post office and to the back of the post office, there was another little door. He says, the hotel is upstairs. <laughs> so they pushed open the door and it was dark and it was narrow and there was no lighting and they they went up this narrow dark stairway and then Hudson Taylor led them through the pitch dark stairs and found and then went into an apartment and it was 12 feet square and there was no adornment in it except a little table in the middle of the room that was his hotel so they all sat down and turn to John chapter 17. Hudson Taylor read John chapter 17 to them. I'm not gonna read the whole chapter. But he read John 17 after he talked to them about their journey and got to know them a little bit. 
Of course, John 17 is the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ. But after he read John 17, he asked them this question. He said, what are the meaning? What is the meaning of the final phrase, final few statements of John 17? So let me just read that last verse of John 17, where Jesus in prayer says, I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. So Taylor said, what is the meaning of that last statement, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them? Why do you think Taylor asked them that? You know, it, it doesn't really say in the book why he asked them that. It just says he asked them that. But as a reader, that's why I love to read this particular autobiography, because it would make me think. And then I would just have to put the book down and then meditate on the scripture and just put myself there as a missionary in this strange land. And here's this veteran missionary that they had high respect for, and he's weaved them through the Chinese section of Shanghai and sat them down in this little desolate room and said, what do these words mean? You need to know what these words mean if you're going to make it in China. You need to hear the cry for help and understand the words of Jesus said. Basically what Jesus is saying here, and he's praying for us. He's praying for his followers. What is he praying? He's praying that the love, think about this deep love. How much does the Father love Jesus? How much does the Father love Jesus with an infinite love, eternal love, an everlasting love? Jesus is saying that the love wherewith thou hast loved me will be in you. That the love the Father has for Jesus, you'll have that love. <laughs> then I'll have that love. To hear this cry for help, we must have this everlasting love of God in us. And then he says, not only that, that love, and notice the phrase, in them, that that love will be in us, but who else will be in us? Jesus himself, by his spirit, in us. So we need the everlasting love of the Father and the everlasting life of the Son. If we're going to hear this cry, come over into Macedonia. And if we're going to be the missionaries, that will be faithful and fruitful for the glory of God. Let's pray. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for your great love to us. And we praise you. Oh, Father, praise you for the love that you have for your son. And yet you sent your son to die for us. And we do pray that we will have this love in our hearts for Jesus. That's an infinite love, Father God. But we know that you do great miracles. So help us, Lord, to hear this cry for help. Help us to embrace the ministry that you've given to us during these days of confusion. Many people, days of, of anger and cynicism days of unbelief and apostasy, atheism, ag agnosticism. But Lord, give us faith to stand in love and with the power of your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. I'm going to